Division members are summoned before the division political officer just prior to moving to the attack site. Squad and platoon leaders wear banners proclaiming their determination to avenge the bombings of the North. Similar pledges are printed on cards fastened to the hats of individual soldiers. Here the division political officer presents ropes to regimental political officers as a sign of his confidence that the battle will be won and prisoners will be taken. The regimental political officers, in turn, use the ropes to inspire confidence in the soldiers directly under their command. The bugler sounds the attack and the individual platoons and companies move on foot to their respective positions. The Viet Cong attack is against an American armored personnel carrier. The vehicle is destroyed and several members of its crew are killed. Prisoners captured during the battle are marched barefoot through the jungle. Next, we have a series of newsreel sequences on Viet Cong attacks against Allied units in South Vietnam, with Tay Minh's Black Virgin Mountains in the background, the communist guerrillas make ready. Women and children carry supplies and ammunition to the designated depots. Weapons and equipment used by the VC are Soviet models, most of which have been manufactured in communist China. The first attack will be against the South Vietnamese outpost, manned by soldiers of the Civilian Irregular Defense Group, the CIDG. A final communications check is made using both communist and captured American manufactured equipment. The South Vietnamese forces walk into the ambush and the Viet Cong open fire. The jungle has provided the Viet Cong with a strategic sanctuary from which to strike. When the battle is ended, no weapons are left behind. Any Viet Cong who brings in an enemy weapon is decorated for his heroic deed. The captured equipment is of great importance to the communists in their guerrilla war. And this fact is emphasized strongly in these propaganda newsreels. When the weapons and ammunition have been returned to the base camp, they're logged in, stockpiled, and checked out for the next communist assault. The enemy in the Republic of Vietnam makes use of every tactic, old and new, in guerrilla warfare. In this next sequence, the Viet Cong company commander plots an all-out attack against a small South Vietnamese hamlet. The bugler once again sounds the charge and the VC stream out of the jungle to overrun the settlement. The communists have undergone grueling physical training programs to prepare themselves emotionally and psychologically for the harsh demands of guerrilla warfare. Attacks such as the one shown here are undertaken to harass Allied units in the area.
prisoners are taken, and they're identified as members of the Civilian Irregular Defense Guard and the 10th Vietnamese Government Army Division. The PWs, as in the earlier sequence, are marched off for interrogation. With the battle won, the Viet Cong are welcomed into the hamlet by their communist supporters. And according to the original newsreel commentary, a special program is presented by the women of the settlement in tribute to their so-called liberators. Much of the food, weapons, and equipment used by the Viet Cong is transported into tactical areas by walking the material across the countryside. Here, bags of rice are carried across a river and into the jungle. Women, many of them armed, make up more than half of the communist transportation force. Another of the primary means of transportation is by bicycle. Each bicycle is reinforced so that it can carry more than 300 pounds over rough terrain and up to 500 pounds on level ground. The Viet Cong are equally thorough in their utilization of captured weapons and equipment. Demolition experts disassemble unexploded bombs and remove their destructive contents. Blacksmiths then use the metal to make grenade casings and gun barrels. In the guerrilla warfare that the Viet Cong are waging, nothing is wasted. Everything is utilized. The communists adapt their ways to the war they must fight. Booby traps are fashioned by hand and planted at night outside the perimeter of U.S. and South Vietnamese camps. Next, we see a graphic demonstration of the methods used and the objectives achieved in sabotaging railroads and bridges in the Republic of Vietnam. The communists, wherever they can, coerce or impress local inhabitants to help them in their destructive raids. government train that has been derailed is grim witness to the effectiveness of the VC tactics. Blasting is more expensive, but the results are also more thorough. Small charges placed at the joints of the rails on both sides of the track can tear open gaps that are undetectable at a distance and will almost certainly cause a derailment. Here, with the aid of a model bridge, a Viet Cong instructor briefs the communist guerrilla before sending them out with the demolition team. The explosive charge is prepared by other members of the guerrilla unit. move through the jungle toward their objective. Reaching the bridge, the communist guerrillas climb the span to plant their explosives. The locations are pre-planned, for a reconnaissance team has already visited the bridge and determined the best locations for placing the charges. Mission accomplished. The bridge is destroyed. 
This third segment of our captured Viet Cong newsreels opens with banners and signs welcoming communist Chinese writers on their arrival for a tour of Cosman facilities in War Zone C. There is the customary exchange of toasts between the guests and their hosts. And as part of the welcoming reception, the representatives of the two communist nations exchange photographs of Ho Chi Minh and Mao Zedong. An entertainment troupe from North Vietnam is also on hand, and the Chinese writers witness a performance of traditional Vietnamese dances. Communist correspondents visit a printing plant that publishes the Viet Cong Liberation newspaper and other propaganda leaflets and literature. They watch the setting of type by a VC craftsman and they see the operation of the primitive press by the printer and his apprentice. The visit concludes with the presentation to the group of the latest issue of the Viet Cong Liberation newspaper. Located in the heart of War Zone C, the main hospital for Cosman has facilities to care for up to 500 patients. The wounded Viet Cong soldiers are carried from the battle area to the hospital in hammock-type litters. The casualties are met by doctors and nurses, quickly examined, and assigned to wards in the underground hospital. Once again, the motion pictures give evidence of the ways in which the Viet Cong adapt themselves to the conditions under which they wage their war of insurgency. In these next scenes, the hospital has a distinguished visitor, a four-star general, Noyan Chi Tan, member of the North Vietnam Politburo and former political officer of the North Vietnamese Army. When these films were made, the general was the political officer and commanding general of the Communist Army in South Vietnam. Here, General Tan walks among the wounded, talking with them and listening to them. Continuing his tour of the underground facilities, the General commends the hospital staff for its contributions to the Viet Cong war effort. General Tan has a final visit and a word with a wounded VC soldier, pledging continued reinforcements and communist support from the North. Now, a meeting of Cosman officials held to plan the winter-spring offensive of 1967 and to bolster troop morale for these campaigns. The featured speaker is the chief of the political section of Cosman, Brigadier General Trong Do. The general tells the troops that there are 400,000 men in North Vietnam that can be sent south to aid the Viet Cong forces. In conclusion, he promises that North Vietnam will never negotiate for peace until it has achieved a measure of victory in combat that can be used as a bargaining power in such negotiations. <laughs> 